Um, Hugh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I hope this is on. Um, uh, I just hope your pronunciation of uh, uh, African languages is better than the Chinese. But, uh, <laughs> um, Honourable Minister, uh, uh, ministers, um, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, could I simply start by saying what a huge pleasure once again it is to be here um, at this conference um, and to have the opportunity to address you. Um, I would like to also say a huge thank you to the South African uh, Department of Basic Education for all the support and help um, and encouragement that you and your colleagues have given to us in the British Council um, in working together on this conference. It has been a partnership which we genuinely value. Um, language is one of the defining features of our species. Language is essential in giving us our identity and defining and limiting the range of interlocutors with whom we work, or talk, or, or, or engage. Whether in our, our towns, our cities, our nations, at an international conference like this one, or virtually and globally through internet-based communication, language is the medium through which we uh, uh, engage with each other. Yet language is also too often neglected as an important factor in human development and as a crucial issue in education. And I very much hope that this conference will make a contribution to rectifying that situation. We also need to recognize that learning a language, in addition to our mother tongue, implies choices. Cho choosing to learn a second language, or frequently in Africa, or indeed other parts of the world, a third, or fourth, or even a fifth language, is often more than simply a practical decision. It implies aspirations and status, and aspirations for the future for ourselves and our families, which would be extremely unwise for us to ignore. We know that Africa is the world's most linguistically diverse continent. 22 of the 30 most linguistically diverse nations are here in Africa. And most Africans are multilingual, with competence in one or more local languages learned from parents and family at an early age, as well as regional languages, African lingua franca, and European languages, including French, Portuguese, and of course, the language is increasingly becoming the world's common tongue, English. And each of these languages is predominant in its own domain, between family members, when trading across borders, or when dealing with officialdom. And African multilingualism is to be celebrated. It is an opportunity and a huge advantage that Africa has which I think is all too often underestimated. And the challenge is to find ways to harness it so that it makes a real contribution to the social and economic development of the continent. Now, of course, multilingualism is not unique to Africa. As we heard yesterday, the European Union is a vibrant multilingual space. Or at least part of the European Union is a vibrant multilingual space. With the Commissioner for Education, Culture, Multilingualism and Youth, but I've often argued for much more recognition of the value of languages in my own country, in the United Kingdom, which is perceived with some justification as being too monolingual for its own good. Indeed, it may well be that monolingualism is a huge disadvantage in a globalizing world, not an advantage at all. Within the British Council's broad remit of international cultural relations, our mission includes the promotion of education, encouraging international educa ed educational collaboration, and developing, yes, developing a wider knowledge of the English language. And there may sometimes seem to be tensions between these aims, but I think it is quite possible to see that they work in harmony. Above all, our support for English is as a language in addition to the languages spoken by individuals, not instead. It is English as within the context of multilingualism that we wish to promote not uh, English as a dominant or domineering language. High quality education is essential for any nation wishing to build a knowledge economy, encourage international trade, improve public health, or increase equity. The Millennium Development Goals, in as much as they have addressed education, focused on access, and in particular universal access to primary education. And in the years since the publication of the goals, more and more focus has been given to the issues of quality. There can be no quality without access. It's equally true that there's going to be no learning without quality. And this, unfortunately, is the situation which far too many states find themselves in. 
And by quality, I mean the attainment of good learning outcomes. There has been an improvement in availability and take up of school places. And many studies have shown that the results remain inadequate. Learning outcomes are the result of a number of factors, including good physical and emotional condition of the children, an appropriate curriculum, good pedagogical approaches, good teachers and teaching, and the correct physical context and resources, especially books. It applies across the board, from early childhood education to university and adult education systems. And there's a huge amount to be done in each one of these areas. The work of improving quality is never done, unfortunately, Minister, um, even in the most economically developed countries. And you only have to look at the PISA results from my own country in the UK, published in the last few weeks, um, to understand how the drive for constant improvement and meeting the quality challenges of a globalizing world is not something which we can never say, right, we've done that, and now we move on to the next thing. The job of the ministries of education and other education authorities is to create policies and improve learning outcomes. But ministers are also expected to listen to the people. And in the case of education, that means listening more than anything else to the parents. And we in the British Council are often asked by parents, how can I make, get my child to learn English? How can I give my child better English than I have? Parents see English as a language of opportunity, either because it's the official na national language, or because it is the language of administration, or because it is the language of business and trade. It is frequently seen as a way, a key to getting a good job, moving out of poverty, aspiring to better life. And it's seen that way because indeed that is what it offers for people. It's often seen as a means of create, changing the fortunes of whole, com of whole families, but also the route through into international, genuine international opportunity, being part of that global world not just part of the local world. But for most people, there is an equally strong motivation to maintain your personal ties with the community and the history, with a sense of identity, with your culture, with where you've come from. Everyone knows stories of those who've most so, moved so far away from their, 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 their home background, their home culture, that they effectively become rootless. We do not want language to be a source of rootlessness. And I, could I suggest that one of the key things for this conference is to find the right balance between these two competing forces. Finding the right pace for the language of international communication, international opportunity, together with the local language, the sense of identity, and the commitment to your local and personal culture. It's one of the most important things that any of us need to be able to do. Healthy children, the appropriate curriculum, good teaching, adequate resources form the basis of a successful education system. The ingredient which is too often neglected is language, and the, particularly the language of instruction. The choice of language or languages to use in an educational contract text is crucial. Policy decisions might be made appropriately at different levels in different situations, by government regulation, by the local authority, by the institution, or indeed by the classroom teacher, based on the makeup of the particular class. All of these have their place and their implication. What does seem difficult to argue against is the fact that you cannot learn something in a language you don't understand. If you want to teach me chemistry, maths, or history, and I want to learn, but you use a language I do not understand, whether it's Swahili or Greek or Hindi, you're not going to be successful. We are not going to be successful. You as the teacher and I as the learner. The right language does not guarantee learning, but the wrong language certainly guarantees not learning. Of course, you may point out that I'm not a six-year-old or indeed a 13-year-old, and you would unfortunately be correct. Um, but the thing, and the things may well be different in those cases. And it is true that in the right circumstances, a young person is able to learn a language much more quickly than someone of my age. But we should, not be, we should be careful not to underestimate the time needed, even for a young child, to reach a level to benefit in full from what is happening in the classroom 
is considerable. Also, we should be aware that while children can learn languages quickly, under the right circumstances, those circumstances are very often not always in place. What learners need is a rich linguistic input at the right level, motivating and age-appropriate activities and attention to the learner's individual needs. I hope that this conference will consider to what extent these circumstances are in place in the public education systems with which we are familiar. It is because these factors, uh, of these factors that the academic consensus for home language medium of instruction or mother tongue based multilingual education has developed. And while this consensus is not new, after all, UNESCO argued for this language and education approach 60 years ago, it remains a matter of debate in the whole society beyond academic circles. Policymakers and politicians do not always pay attention to the academic consensus, especially when it conflicts with other views, especially the views of those who are going to elect them. So how should a policymaker deal with a strong lobby from parents who demand a high quality education for their child, who see education as the critical way, the key way to lift their children into a better uh, uh, economic and social uh, environment than perhaps the one they were, live, they were born into. All of us want a better life for our children than perhaps we had for ourselves. And all too, and all too often, parents see the most, one of the most important parts of that education as being access to English language. And one reason is that English is indeed emerging as the 21st century's uh, skill that does lift children and families from the local or even from the national into the international community. We know, and studies have shown, that children in parts of Africa who have access to English are 30% more likely to get a job, and lifetime learnings are likely to be 50% greater than those who do not. The parents are not wrong. English is a critical skill which children need. Aspiring parents will often see, see their society's elite also getting that higher ed quality education usually in the private sector, and with an English medium approach. So if it's good enough for you, why is it not good enough for my child also? And this is happening right across the developing world, certainly in South Asia and parts of Africa. The rise in the provision of English education designated as English medium at a range of quality levels and prices. The provision develops as a response to demand. It appears to be what parents want. And if it is what parents want, then why should policymakers deny them that? And if the provision is in the private sector and for the elite, why should policymakers not aim to make that provision also available in public education systems? And to solve that conundrum, we need to unpick some of the concepts. The underlying desire, I would suggest, of parents for their children is to leave school with a good education and with well-developed English language skills. It is not English medium uh, education in itself that they desire. But it can often be difficult to explain the difference between the concept of teaching a language, English in this case, as a subject, and using that language as a medium for learning. In Europe, we see many peoples, Danes, Germans, Finns, for example, who speak very different languages who've learnt English to an excellent level through their schoolroom classes in English as a subject. But they still learn subjects like science and history to a high level in their native tongue, and indeed emphasize their own native tongue as a part of the wider education system. And it is significant that both USAID and DFID have statements in their education policies in support of home language medium of instruction in primary school. The challenge is to get this over to the general population. And to make it absolutely clear that initial mother tongue language approach is based not as an alternative to English, but alongside the teaching of English, as exemplified by the approach we see uh, the South African Department for Education uh, uh, explaining both in the welcoming note to this conference and in the minister's own speech. In South Africa, English is introduced as a first additional language in the first year of primary school. Policymakers must indeed listen to parents, but what parents want is high quality education for their children. 
a curriculum relevant to the, and appropriate to modern global society. That ideal curriculum is highly likely to include English as a component, but it is not the only component, nor indeed necessarily the most important part. The development of general numeracy and literacy skills, social skills that will allow young people to grow into adults who make a full contribution to their society is as vital as ever. This is what we all seek to achieve. All of us are looking to find ways of providing that to opportunity to our young people. And many parts of the world have not yet succeeded in providing this aspect of uh, quality education. Uh, and there are many factors preventing this achievement, from the need of children to work in the fields and markets before study, to malnutrition and disease, to a lack of adequate teachers. And we all hear stories of uh, schools in different countries where the class teacher spoke neither the official language of instruction nor the same language as the students. Language can be a major factor preventing children from gaining a quality education if it's not well chosen and if it's not well taught. And of course the, ling the language curriculum also needs to be socially relevant. Children must be able to speak to their grandparents in their own tongue. Diversifying and implementing the right language and education policy for, every given, for any uh, context is no easy matter. Too often, the wrong decision is made in relatively straightforward situations where children in a class share a common language. How much more difficult it is in complex environments where perhaps children in the class have no common language, where maybe multiple languages are spoken, as often happens in modern cities, including indeed in London, just as much as it might happen in Johannesburg or in Cape Town. These situations are not amenable to simple solutions. No simple prescription of century-driven policy will solve the problem. And there needs to be room for local communities to develop their own answers, drawing on whatever resources that community can provide. Underlying the problems is a role and perception of the teacher in society. It is a difficult, taxing, and challenging job at the best of times. In a society where the role of the teacher is one of low prestige, the challenge of producing good educational institutions and systems is even greater. Governments need to develop ways of recognizing the value of the teaching profession to ensure a future supply of well-educated, motivated school teachers and leaders. A special challenge for authorities is that of listening to and communicating with the parents in a dialogue that leads all parties to the common aim of high quality education and high quality opportunity for our children. And some of these key principles were set down once again last year in Juba in South Sudan by delegates from a number of organizations, some here again today, include UNESCO, DFID, and Atalan, as well as by the British Council and numerous universities. In addition to celebrating multilingualism and linguistic equ equity, it stresses the benefits of children learning in a language they know very well. And that languages that the child, ch child does not know well should be taught as subjects in a good time for them to be introduced as a language or medium of instruction and as one where children are clearly and uh, if it, uh, 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 proficient. And how do we address that, uh, that, that question about how uh, to respond to the parents' desire for uh, English language? It is also that encouragement to make the change from one medium of instruction, language, to another, gradual rather than sudden. Unfortunately, many systems still fail to follow this guideline and stipulate a sudden change from one mother tongue to English medium, thus often placing an unbearable cognitive load on the child. There are a number of guidelines and models for implementing a gradual shift to English medium. The statement emphasizes the need to improve the teaching of and reading uh, as well as the importance of training of teachers in these skills. Now, Professor uh, Sergina Mazzini, Executive De Director of Atalan, asked us if we would prefer to live in a garden filled with one beautiful flower or with a great variety of beautiful flowers. I, for one, prefer to live in the garden with many flowers. It is perhaps inevitable that for the foreseeable future, much in education in Africa and universities and upper secondary schools will be in the medium of English. Indeed, it may well be one of Africa's great uh, strengths uh, and opportunities uh, that it has this access to the international medium of 
uh, trade, the international medium of communication. Um, the opportunity for individuals to be part of that global world rather than simply the local world. But, it is a very big but. I, for one, do not want to live in a homo homogenized world. For all too many uh, of us in the immediate post-Second World War period, one of the great aspirations was the whole world should speak a single language. I can think of nothing worse than a, la a world where we do not celebrate difference, where we do not celebrate culture, where we do not celebrate identity expressed in the multiplicity of different forms. Language is not there, English is not there to homogenize the world. It is an invaluable tool of international communication, but not at the expense of all the beautiful difference and diversity of our world expressed through language. So for me, we need to celebrate diversity in language, we need to celebrate diversity uh, in culture. We need to diver celebrate diversity in identity. Every new language has a new skill, a new perception of the world, a new way of looking at others, a new way of looking at difference. The need to embrace multilingualism is nowhere more evident than perhaps in my own country in the United Kingdom. And that is why in the last few weeks, we in the British Council have uh, started a new campaign to encourage people in Britain to learn 1,000 words in a new language. Not because we want people to be uh, linguistically fluent in thousands of languages, but because we want people to be culturally fluent in thousands of different cultures. This conference is about the role of language in development. It offers the opportunity for us to send a message on this theme to policymakers as we move into the post-2015 development era. I encourage you, as conference members, as delegates, to work towards a statement that positions language in the central place that it deserves, that speaks to policymakers of all kinds of the need to take language into account when we are uh, developing our educational uh, context, but also within the wider social domain. One which also uh, uh, seeks to place the world languages, whether that is English or any other, within the context of multilingualism, of multiculturalism, which celebrates difference, which doesn't seek to find a single language or a single form of human interaction. I think this is a great opportunity. I'd like to renew my thanks to uh, the Department for Basic Education in South Africa for hosting us here today and for these next couple of days. But I, could I also wish the conference a great deal of success, and I look forward to seeing the outcomes from your discussions. Thank you very much indeed.